we'll call the meeting to, well, I should say the, the City Council Workshop on May 7, 2018, to order. I'm Mayor P.J. Connolly. I'll be moderating the meeting, the workshop. We'll call on City Clerk for the roll. Mayor Connolly. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Council Member Smith. Present. Council Member Bell. Here. Council Member Smiley. Here. Council Member Litchfield. Present. Council Member Meyerhofer. Here. Mayor Connolly, we have a Thank you. I guess we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Madam Manager, any recommended changes? Um, yes, Mayor. We would like to take item number five, which is the discussion of nightclubs and eating establishment, and, and make it item number three. That was what we had intended because of some issues with the we software. Can we, where so. we couldn't. Um, we're just going to slide three down to four. Right. So we're just going to move five up to three and then put the move the other two down. Sounds good. Just really motion or anything like that, right? Yeah. No. Well, that's how okay. we present it. Okay. Sounds good. <coughs> All right. We'll move on to new business. Okay. Mayor, um, the first item we have and um, for the council is that we wanted to provide an update on the employee health clinic. So we have HR Director Leah Futrell is here to make that presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide you all with an update on the um, city's um, employee health clinic. It's hard to believe that it's already been one full year, but it has. Um, and because of the partnership between the city and city invited, it would um, not be proper, I don't think, only fitting, that um, Biden is a part of uh, today's presentation. So joining me today will be uh, Bobby Jo Vaughn. She is the administrator for Biden Corporate Health Services. And Chris Lee, he is the uh, wellness program coordinator for Biden. We'll watch a brief video. It's only about a minute, but it will just provide a little background info. This clinic is extremely important. It's something that we've been working on for a number of years and it's finally come to fruition. Um, it will allow our employees to use the clinic services at no cost to them, no out-of-pocket cost, um, no leave time. So it will just be a, an opportunity for them to take advantage of another great benefit that the city offers. We plan to integrate wellness initiatives into this, so it's not just a, a facility when you're sick or not feeling well or, um, you know, pre-employment or workers' comp, those traditional types of things. It's also um, the wellness piece that's going to be incorporated, so we're encouraging lifelong wellness. Okay, so um, our clinic opened on May 1st, so as I stated just over a year ago. Um, it is located at 1400 Brownlea Drive, and that um, location is pretty strategic. We wanted a location that's um, away from city offices, city hall, so that employees can have a, uh, feel like they have a level of patient confidentiality. Um, but it's still close enough to city office locations so that it's not you know, a, a long drive. Currently, our hours of operation are Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. until 4 p.m. Um, a couple of clinic uh, milestones. Although it's only been a year, we have made some, some milestones um, already. The first was August 1st of 2017 when we allowed uh, retirees under 65, under the age of 65, to use the health clinic. And some of the retirees have taken advantage of that opportunity. Um, and then just recently, May 1st, we added farm, uh, excuse me, pharmacy services. So um, information regarding our pharmacy is going to be going out here in the very near future. Um, but what it allows is on-site dispensing of approximately 12 prescription medications. They're non-narcotics. And they're um, things like antibiotics, um, allergy meds like Flonase, um, which is uh, very needed this time of year. <laughs> um, muscle relaxants such as Flexeril, um, things like uh, prednisone. So a number of um, commonly prescribed medications will be available for dispensing through our clinic and uh, patients can return to the clinic for refills at no cost um, and there is no copay at all for any of the prescription meds. So obviously in addition to savings, um, hopefully this will allow um, patients to be treated sooner for any um, injuries or illnesses. 
Um, a quick review of some of the benefits of our on-site health clinic. Um, for the employee, of course, it's convenient. It's easy access to quality health care through Vida. Um, free, no co-pays at all. Uh, it's obviously confidential, well, HIPAA compliant. Um, a huge benefit, too, is that none of the visits are charged to sick leave, so employees can go without using their sick leave uh, or any type of paid leave. Um, and then just recently, the on-site prescription dispensing. For us, the city, the benefits are, hopefully, and over the long term, healthier employees. Um, we are already seeing some reduction in paid health care costs, um, some also reduction in drug and pre-employment screening costs, workers' comp claim costs, and lost work time and absenteeism. Um, our clinic is operated by Vited Corporate Health, which is great because it allows for that um, separation. Um, it is a service contract. Uh, Vited is responsible for the full operation of the clinic. And currently, city employees, council members, and retirees <coughs> covered under Cigna can use the clinic. Our staffing model is as shown. We have an occupational health nurse on site 40 hours a week, that Monday through Friday, 7 to 4, that was previously stated. We also have a nurse practitioner on site 8 hours a week um, for an annual contract staffing fee of just over $160,000. Okay. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to Bobby Jovan, and she can um, provide some additional information. So I want to tell you a little bit about the services that we're offering there. Um, a couple of things that are important to know, we are um, offering some preventative health care screens. The one thing that I want you to know about our models, we have about 40 different companies that we contract with to provide some type of on-site services. And with this, we do not plan to become a primary health care facility. That's not our model. However, we do have some people in here, mainly probably men, that do not like to go to the doctor. So what we want to do is work with them until they will get in to see their health care provider. And um, I can tell you that over the years, what we find is we form a relationship with the employees and we are the ones that they tend to call and they say, hey, I have this going on. Can you please help me and where should I go? So although we do market some preventative care screenings, please know that's not our primary purpose. And we want to make sure that the team members know that you can go there. We will all give you a physical, but our goal is to really get you into a primary care home. We do treatment of employee illness and medical concerns, and this has been the biggest thing that we've provided so far. This past flu season was harsh, and we saw a lot of your employees at the clinic to be diagnosed with flu, bronchitis, upper GI um, symptoms. So those are some of the things that are the most common. We do provide appropriate care and follow-up. If you come to me and you say, hey, my hypertension has, or my blood pressure's been running really high, we'll continue to monitor that, but then we're going to also make sure that you get the care that you need. As she stated, we're going to start um, also an on-site employee pharmacy. You are our second one of those. The only other one we offer is at Greenville Utilities. Um, we also perform the health and drug screen and pre-employment screens which is amazing because prior to this, they were handling this here in HR. So this is a service that now HR is completely removed from that, so that liability is gone. We perform case management services for the work-related injuries. You currently use PMA, which is the same one that we use at the hospital to process your workers' comp claims. And your nurse, Carol, there, she actually manages your claim, making sure that you get the care that you need. When it's time for you to go back to work, she's going to work with your supervisor to make sure they can accommodate the restrictions and things that are needed. The other thing that we have added this year is the wellness and disease management. Prior, that was held by Cigna, and they were actually doing the on-site cholesterol ch um, checks and blood pressure checks. Now you can get all of that done through the employee health clinic, and Carol does that for you. One of the things that's a big benefit of that is that when we see that your blood sugar is high, Carol's not going to let that go. She's going to call you and say, what have you done about that since the last time you were in? Did you get the follow-up care that you needed? Prior, when you were using Cigna, they were on site one time, and you did not have that resource. 
So when we look at what does the year look like as a summary, we saw 1,290 non-work-related visits. So thank your common flu, your immunizations. For work-related visits, this could be injured workers or um, whether or not you were coming in to get vaccines, we saw 453 for a total of 1,743 visits over the year. When I go back and I look at some of our other companies that are very similar to that, you guys are actually seeing it slightly above utilization. So that's a really great thing. Now this is what most of you are probably interested in. This is the cost analysis. Um, you'll see here our total cost of the operation, 167,660, that pays for the nurse time and the provider time. You'll see here, if we were to bill this to your insurance, Cigna, we would have an average of $96.19 per visit. And if you were to go to an outside clinic, the cost would be $235.305 with a cost of $135 per visit. So you see the cost savings there. So for every dollar you spend, we're able to save you $1.40. When we're looking at that our ROI compared to all of our other clinics at this state, you guys are doing much better at this point. So the other thing I want you to think about is indirect cost, because the great thing about our clinic, most of the time when you go there, you are in and out within 20 minutes. Um, so the assumptions that I use with this, if you go see an on-site provider, or a provider at your doctor's office, you can plan on about two hours loss of work time. So 30 minutes to get there, 30 minutes to get back, and then an hour of office time, if you're lucky. So when you're looking at that, last year when you guys were contracting with another organization to do this, that cost was $72,000. And then if you look at that, plus the cost savings that we're currently providing, you'll see $308,000. That's assuming that the team member had to miss two or more hours of work. And the return on investment for that is every dollar you spend, we're saving $1.80. That is phenomenal compared to many of the other clinics that we're currently at. So first year outcomes, and these are some of the things that I want to point out, and it's also going to be probably our launching path for some of the things that we see we probably want to, to do. 21% decrease in urgent care visits among your employees here, which that's amazing. I mean, urgent care is certainly it serves a purpose, but we knew that a lot of times the things that th your employees were going to those things for, we could handle at the clinic. So this was one year prior to we saw a 21% decrease in urgent care visits. However, when we look at the spouses and the dependents that are currently not able to go to the clinic, their cost this year skyrocketed and they were seeing three times more than they were last year at this time. So that could be, it was a really horrible flu season. So were they going to the physician just to you know, alleviate those symptoms? Probably, but certainly something that we need to look at going forward with our model. We did see a 4% decrease in your personal care physician visits. And sometimes I worry about this because believe it or not, we do want you to go to your primary care doctor. We want to make sure you have the relationship. But we do know at our clinic, we can handle many of the acute things. If you're going for poison ivy, if you're going for pink eye, if you're going for upper respiratory symptoms. So we did see a decrease in that. The other thing I think it's important to note is that when we look at your insurance costs per member per year, it's the same, same among employees. And I don't know how much you know about healthcare, but if you actually have the same and you're not rising or decreasing, that's a really great thing. Um, but I can tell you that we did see an increase this year in your spouses and your dependents by 12%. So one of the things that we're gonna do from this point forward, this is some preliminary information we've got from Cigna. The next thing is when they come on site this year, we're gonna be present and we're gonna ask the questions. Let's look where are we spending those healthcare dollars. Is it things that we can control? You know, when I look at the ER utilization and things like that, um, one of the things that I want to know is, okay, maybe it was just a really bad car accident that a team member had or their family or spouse. Um, when we look at our ER visits, they did increase slightly, but the steerable visits remain the same. So I do think there's more room there for some marketing and different things that we can do to still promote the clinic. What we've done th at this point is we've pulled a list and we know of the departments who's used the clinic and who has not. So we definitely want to um, devise some marketing strategies around how can we increase that. When we look at overall clinic utilization, 71% of your employees have actually used the clinic in some shape, form, or fashion. That's amazing. Way better than any other clinic that I have. We do have 29% that have not used the facility. 
Um, so certainly some opportunity, but um, these are amazing results because if we look at the time of year that we started, typically June, July, and August are any clinic's slowest year, and it's our slowest time of the year, and that's when we started. If those 71% are using other doctors? That is one of the things that we've requested for them, absolutely. Because okay. we want to make sure, we, what we want to be able to show, of course, is of those that are using your clinic, your PMPM is less than any other one. So that's some of the information that we're going to be requesting from them. Um, right now, they have provided basic information, and I'm sure you know Greenview Utilities is mixed into your data, so we have to get all that separated, but that's certainly something we're going to look at. Um, so compared to our similarly, similarly modeled clinics, your clinic is doing very well. The ROI looks really good at this point. I do think that opportunities going forward will continue to be to study those healthcare claims, see where we're spending the money, see what we can do to impact some of those costs. Um, you know, when we started the formulary of the pharmacy, right now we're really just, we kind of shot blind at that and said, okay, what are the most common things? But what we want to do is actually go in and look at your pharmacy benefits and see where you're spending that money to see if there's opportunity to save there too. And now I think I turn it back over to Leah. What's the, um, what's the size of the population in terms of clinic visits or utilization or whatever between employees and dependents? Chris, do you know that right off hand? It's currently not open to dependents, so it's I know, but I mean, employees. across, across all health care usage, what percentage are we paying for, that we pay for, what percentage are our employees, and what percentage are our employees? I'd say 50 to 60 percent are for employees, mm -hmm. and another 40 percent for dependents. So you have 1621 total employees, 493 spouses, and 1385 dependents. So I do think by offering and opening it up to the dependents, we could possibly see that. I will tell you at um, Greenview Utilities, unfortunately, we are not having lots of people come that are dependents, which blows my mind because I guess I think I have four kids. And when I take them to get a flu shot and I'm in that little bitty tiny room waiting for that, I sit there and think, what in the world? This is crazy. And you can walk into a clinic and get a flu shot just like that. Well, it just blows my mind. Well, one thing I think that would make us different from GUC is that we have an off-site clinic. I uh, agree. That is completely Absolutely. Right. independent of the so overall nobody operational sees you're going in. So there's a lot more you know, security mm -hmm. right. with, with I that. Agree. I think we will touch on that here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in, in summary, obviously, as the data sh um, shows, our health clinic has been very successful this first year, and we anticipate that that will continue to be the case. Um, we know our employees view it as a significant value-added benefit because they told us so. <laughs> um, we also know that the, uh, the city is experiencing medical plan savings from redirecting some of the care, and our partnership with Vita is, is critically important, so, um, you know, that's, that's great. Uh, moving forward, we want to definitely continue to market our health clinic to eligible users. You know, we realize we've got that 29% uh, of employees who've not yet used the clinic, so we want uh, to ensure that should they new, uh, need to use it, that they know that they can use it. Um, beginning July 1, we want to expand our coverage. So we want to allow covered spouses and dependent children ages 13 and over um, that are, <coughs> excuse me, covered under Cigna to use our health clinic. Um, again, spouses are huge, huge cost drivers, so we want um, them particularly to be able to use the clinic. And then, effective July 1, we also want to expand the number of hours that we have a provider on site, whether that's an MD or um, expand the hours of our nurse practitioner. So we want to go from eight hours per week, where we currently are, to 12 hours a week. Um, right now, we're already at close to capacity status for our provider. So we know that if we allow, which our intentions are, um, spouses and dependent children to use the clinic, that we're going to have even greater utilization, and so we need additional hours from our provider. provider. Um, so that's where we are. Any questions at all? So adding spouses and dependent children over 13 adds 30, 40, 30, 40 percent to the capacity, to the raw capacity, to the raw utilization. I realize they don't use, these people don't use it at the same level, and at this point, it's pretty maybe difficult to predict what they would use it. Our other, you know, comparison to other facilities suggests that they won't okay. use, use it as much. Right. But again, our employees use it more than other, mm -hmm. other. So maybe our. Um, 
So, All right. so we're taking sort of baby steps. Mm -hmm. So instead of like doubling it from 8 to 16, we said initially we would just look at going from 8, the 8 to the 12, just to see what the um, utilization is like. Because we can always increase, you know, assuming we have the and, <laughs> and the limiting factor is, is for the foreseeable future is personnel staffing, right? We don't have any, we don't think, it, we, don't think we have likely space um, limitations oh, in the next yeah. few. So you can just, as long as you're putting more, you can put more nurses and more nurse practitioners right. in there right. long, long before we're going to run out of... Uh, yeah, that's correct. Because we actually, that another important thing about that facility is the space that's right now underutilized. So we have office space that can be converted to additional lab space if needed. So that's, that's the beauty of our system. We don't have to add-on or anything like that. We, we've got a system that's very flexible in terms of staffing and in terms of actual facility space. What, what data supports uh, the fact that spouses would not use it as much as the actual It's controls? really just our history based upon any other clinic that we have. They just are not utilizing it nearly as much. Grandview Utilities is the example that's probably more similar to yours. And I don't know, we've had less than 10%, I think, that even go there to use it. But like he said, you brought up a good point. You guys, are, it's a freestanding clinic, so employees and families may feel more comfortable to go to that. But most likely those spouses are going somewhere. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And we're seeing that in your health care claims calls. They're going somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the information. We appreciate sure. your partnership with Biden. But the takeaway for the 12, trailing 12 months is 60 grand, David? 67. Is that the number? Approximately. Which is uh, for, on so, health care. What is the copay? Awesome. What is the average copay, I guess? How much? It's $20 for a piece of pizza. So it's like $34,000. It's like George Bush asking so like about a, a, savings for like the George Bush asking right? what, a, what a gallon of milk costs. You know, it's like, yeah. man, I don't know anymore. Was that, but that number is not included in there as far as because we're only looking at the the cost savings for the city. So That's the, the number of sixty thousand dollars. So on top of that, you're talking about another thirty four thousand dollars. So almost close to a hundred thousand dollars savings. Maybe not just for us, but with the employees too. Right, for the employees to save too. Plus, it makes healthcare. You know, the benefits of the clinic are so uh, are, are, there's so many. It gives employees an easy access to medical. It makes it a little. Um, user friendly because what we want, especially employees that have chronic illness, we want employees to engage with the clinic. We want them to have, find treatment for their chronic illness because that's good for them and it's good for us in the long term. I think the location's great too. Yeah. I mean, I think it's that off site clinic is much better. And I think one of the things that GEC has is you've got to go into their main facility and walk down a bunch of right. narrow hallways. And I don't, I mean, it seems kind of almost intimidating. So. Right. I think this is great. This is all side. I will say kudos to Michael, to Leah, to the right. HR team for getting a clinic put in because this is this is a great benefit that we can give to our employees that really, in the end, is, has a real positive for the city as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And to Biden as well. Okay. Um, next item, Mayor, yep. is an update on the Greenville right. Youth at Work program, and um, Leah will pr provide this update as well. Um, just as a, some background information, we're actually entering our third summer of the Greenville Youth at Work program, thanks to um, the council um, donating or um, wanting funds included for this. So um, it's been very successful and um, have some information um, to show you uh, in that regard. But just as an overview, the purpose is to um, support the council's strategic plan initiatives to provide employment and training opportunities to the extent possible. So again, in March of 2016, Council authorized and approved sun funding for the Greenville Youth That Work Summer Program. It is a partnership with Region Q, um, which is funded, federally funded, through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And it provides employment, training, and educational activities uh, to eligible low-income youth who are ages 16 to 24 who face barriers to employment. Um, some of those barriers to employment may be um, that they um, are at risk of dropping out of school, um, that they may have be um, offenders, um, that they may be parenting or pregnant, um, or they may be in the foster system. So um, obviously 
Uh, those are some barriers to employment. Um, the city provides funding for 20 youth, whereas the program provides funding for an additional five youth. Um, the staff at Region Q, they actually, um, you know, markets the program and they refer um, qualified candidates to HR. One of the things that HR does is in order to basically simulate what an actual interview would be like, we interview all of the candidates every summer um, to determine what their career interests are so that to the extent possible, we try to align their career interests with what we have to offer, okay? So those youth um, who reside in the city um, or funded by the city must meet the same eligibility requirements um, as the other youth. The pay rate is $8.50 per hour, and the youth generally work up to 29 hours per week for up to seven weeks in various city departments. Um, and I think they've pretty much worked in uh, every city department. Uh, fire rescue, police, our, the PAL program through police, um, administrative offices, they've worked in the city manager's office, human resources, um, again, pretty much every, every city office, and including recreation and parks. They work as office staff, light laborers, staff assistants. The program is three-pronged. Um, the first is work readiness. So before they even begin their work experience with the city, they attend workshops that are provided by Pitt Community College. Um, they attend a full week and they um, sit in on workshops that are um, developed regarding how to interview properly, you know, mock interviews, how to dress for success, um, communication skills, those types of things. And then the work experience, and that's where the city of Greenville comes in. We're providing the work experience component so that they know what it's like to come to work every day, to um, have good work habits, good work skills, those types of things. And then that the third component is the career readiness certificate. Any of you all familiar with the CRC? Okay, that's a big deal right now. So through this program, um, the youth are allotted time to obtain their CRC certifications. And that's great because that's a portable certification that they can take with them you know, from employer to employer to basically show that they have the skills or um, the training necessary to do the work in their industry. So that's, that's big. And um, they also, the youth also receive $100 on top of their pay if they obtain their CRC certification. That's sort of an additional incentive for them to obtain that CRC. These are some statistics from our 2017 um, program uh, last summer. So again, we um, uh, offered work experience to 25 youth. Um, of those 25 youth, because this information was provided to me um, a couple of weeks ago through the um, person who's the coordinator of the program um, at Pitt Community College, but what she indicated to me is that of those 25 youth who worked uh, through the city's program last year, 11, which is approximately 44% of the youth, are now working full-time in various uh, industries. Um, two are working part-time. One is self-employed. One of the youth decided to enroll in a four-year university, which is great. Um, six are still in high school, because remember, the ages can be 16 to 24. Um, two have graduated high school, but they're in the work experience program of, of the program with another employer. And two are actively seeking employment. So you can see from these numbers that that's wonderful <laughs> because remember, um, the youth in this program are not youth who can just easily go out and you know, find a job. These are youth who face barriers to employment. And for nearly half of them to be working full time, I think is outstanding. Um, the next slide is actually um, an example that we can share with you. Do you all recognize Diamond Streeter? Yes. She, yeah, she worked in the city manager's office for several months and then she came and uh, worked in the human resources department for a few months. So she's a huge success story that we like to brag on her um, because just recently she obtained a full-time position and she points out that it's a full-time position with benefits <laughs> uh, at ECU. So she's working there as a full-time administrative assistant and um, she gives credit to her work experience through the city for her current um, job with ECU. So we're certainly very proud of her. Did she have any employment history before this? I think it was something very, very basic, not, 
you know, if, if any, but very basic. That's yeah. great. So through, through the work experience, she was able to gain computer skills, uh, receptionist skill, customer service skills, those types of things. Um, and I think the manager and assistant city managers have been sharing with you all um, a position that is being proposed in the upcoming uh, budget uh, so for training um, specialists specialist that we would like to have. And that position, if funded, would um, supervise our work at, uh, youth at work program to hopefully expand it because when this position was, um, this program was first put in place, the idea was not to just have it um, a city of Greenville uh, program. We wanted it to uh, expand you know, to other employers um, and so that other employers would adopt our model. And so we hope that this person could certainly work diligently to ensure that. Um, we've done what we could, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mr. Ernest Lee with Pitt Community College asked me to come out and talk about the city's experience with the uh, program because other municipalities were there, like Farmville, some of the smaller municipalities, because they're also um, wanting to do something very similar to what Greenville has done. So, you know, we're hopeful that that um, works out, uh, not just in the public sector, but also in the private sector. Okay. Any questions? I think if you are considering expanding it, you're going to need some data about um, what the common outcomes for people who aren't enrolled in the pro in the program are. Um, you know, I mean, I, it's a great thing. I'm, I'm I'm very pleased to see us do it, but you know, it's a uh, uh, you know, just say that you know, the 40 or 50 percent of the people in the program succeed. You know, you know it, it may be that 40 or 50 percent of the people who weren't in the program would succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not. I mean, if you're coming from a truly at risk population, then I certainly can see that, especially if you're thinking about expanding it, let's not expand it solely on the basis of that. Let's have some collaborating data. Sure. Okay. So, um, have we done any thought about we have a clean city initiative that we're trying to do? And one of the things that was asked is, can we have any of our youth um, help with the part of that process? Because the city is very dirty. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our staff can't see it. So I think that if we have fresh eyes and we have certain areas they're assigned to, maybe they can see it. So does that work under sanitation? Do we have any people working in the sanitation department or maybe with code enforcement as far as? Yeah, I mean, if that's areas where we can direct our attention to, with this upcoming summer um, work experience, so, you know, last year I do know that there were some youth, um, Kevin? Yeah, that who were assigned to public works um, through buildings and grounds. So That's correct. We have yeah. one. We plan that for this year. Yeah. So okay. we can certainly direct our efforts there. I mean, that's that's something to look at because it's if we're trying to do it, um, I don't believe in just talking it. You got to do it. And right. so if we have them. That's a way for them to um, start getting experience, and then you can check out their work ethic, and mm -hmm. of course graduate to other projects that might be more a little bit more um, strenuous or thought provoking. Right. But I think that's a a, a good benefit from the city because we're paying them mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Uh, my next question: CRC. Uh -huh. um, how long does it take to get that certificate on average? Several weeks. Um, because there's, you know, they, unless the individual is already pretty well prepared, mm -hmm. otherwise it does take several weeks because they, they have to prepare, they have to study, they have to do those types of things to get ready to test. So are they um, evening classes? Some of them are evening. Um, th through this program, remember, they only work 29 hours a week. So those other hours are devoted to towards obtaining their CRC certification and other things like that. So, um, yes. And what's, so the, what's the cost for that? For the CRC certification? I don't know because it's paid uh, for by the program, not by the city. Okay. Right. So there's no cost to the youth or to the city for the CRC certification. Okay. And the um, we're looking at at-risk at youth. That's right. Mm -hmm. And Region Q, they're screening these individuals. Do we know what process they're using? Because that's kind of one of those things when you say at-risk, because you can't look at someone and tell if they're at-risk. Right. Um, there, there are some guidelines, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just, I'm not just yeah. wondering. Yeah, there are some guidelines that they have to follow. For instance, a lot, quite a few of their referrals come through the Department of Social Services because of the income requirement. Um, and they also get referrals through the school system. 
So they have a set of criteria that they use to determine, you know, if the youth meets that meets their criteria, because it, it's funded through, through a federal grant uh, or federal funds. So they have to ensure that they are adhering to those guidelines. So any youth who may be interested mm -hmm. can contact. Um, I have the person's. I can give you that person's name. Okay. I don't have. I have her name, Sheena Robertson. I just don't have her phone number with me at the moment, but I can email you that. Um, no, that's we greatly appreciate it. And the training specialist position. Mm -hmm. So currently, when we had the uh, youth from last year, uh -huh. who who was the person responsible for supervising all of them? It depends on where they're working. So they're supervised by the department person. So right. this training specialist, what will their role? They're going to be over overseeing the program, not the actual youth participants, but mm -hmm. the actual program to try to de expand the program because right now again. We're still kind of using our model from two summers right. ago. You know, the 20 youth funded by the city, the additional five. So, you know, maybe there are some other things that we could do beyond that. You know, um, again, we certainly want to make other reporters within the Greenville area aware of the program because I don't think a lot of them even are aware that it exists. Um, last year, um, I spoke to the Rotary, new Rotary, about the program. And a lot of the uh, individuals there didn't seem to know about the program. So we're just looking for ways to do outreach so that um, others are aware of the program, benefits to them. And this is just one component. There are other things like apprentices, apprenticeship type things mm -hmm. that can be offered by the employer. So those are things that, that we could potentially look at for the city as well. So not just to have the same model year after year mm -hmm. year, but to do things um, in addition to this. And my last question on this is, while, they're, while we're looking for that trained specialist, uh -huh. um, can we have this to be done in our economic development department so we can at least get things off the ground? The, have the, the this training specialist position, can we have some of the work that we're trying to get done? Well, that would be one, one aspect of, of their duties. Mm -hmm. the, the primary role that that position would serve would be workforce development city employees, you know, train our uh, employees in, you know, different training topics. Um, so this would be an additional duty for that person. Um, now, that's not to say, obviously, I think that they, in, in they're performing that duty, certainly they would be working very closely with the economic development team to ensure that, you know, everybody's on the same page, um, that sort of thing. Um, but because the duties would be limited and there would be additional duties, that's why it's recommended for the resources department. So the, the program's currently, currently being overseen by existing staff in the department. Correct. That's correct. And when you say funded by, um, mm -hmm. is it costing the city anything for these 20 slots? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, other, other than wages, $8.50 an hour? No, nothing other than wages. And, and the time that's not, you know, that's spent towards supervising their employees. But. But we're receiving output for the eight dollars and fifty. Right. So you know, I mean, if, if we get forty applicants, why wouldn't we consider expanding it? Is that what's happening now? Are we getting more applicants than we can handle? Yeah, because right now the city of Greenville is kind of the employer in this area for this program. Mm -hmm. So one of the some of the conversations that I've had with um, the, the uh, individuals at Pitt Community College is. You know, it's great. You know, the city. We want to be able to to offer this to other to to the youth, but we also want to ensure that other employers are aware that they're so that they can do the same thing if they if they so choose. So, to answer your question, yes, there are more youth than the 25 that we are able to to bring on board. Um, but we're hoping that the program can find other employers who will place those youth. Will you go back to that slide that shows the, the percentage of, so, I mean, that looks pretty successful. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. We would want to make sure that what the work experience that we were able to provide was meaningful work experience for the for these students, that this was a great opportunity for them to learn about skills and occupations that they didn't have exposure to. Um, part of what um, Liam mentioned re related to the training specialist is, 
and I think this might be what Councilmember Smith was alluding to as well, is that it, this is a great model. It's proven successful for the city. We would like to share it with other employers in the community so that if they have opportunities that they would be interested in partnering with Region Q, Region Q to be able to provide a similar kind of model for students. Because what we know is that meaningful work experience is really important for high school for high school kids and um, really sets them on a great tra trajectory. Well, I, yeah, I, I would agree with all that. But also work experience just in general, whether right. it's like mm -hmm. Councilmember Smith said, um, you know, picking up trash or, or I mean, it's mm -hmm. keeping them off the streets. Right. Um, it's paying them an income. It's mm -hmm. cleaning our city for eight dollars right. and fifty cents an hour. Um, how many employees do we have at eight dollars eight and fifty cents an hour rate right now? I do not no. know off the top of my head. You shouldn't have any. Right. Because I made the yeah. Twenty-five. Yeah. Pass that. Yeah. <laughs> program. Yeah. So. so to be a higher amount, you know. The, 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 yeah. Right. Which our funding is. That's there. pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm the statistics of, of, of the outcomes. I, I would think that it would make sense to expand upon it if we if we had the need for those people. Yeah, and we can certainly look to see in partnership with, if we could find a funding source for the certification that would go along with that. Because that's a, we can't discount, that's a very important part of this as well. Not the, the work experience they gain plus the certification yes. allows them to carry that forward with them wherever they go. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, we may be limited on how much meaningful, you know, in, and everybody's definition of meaningful certainly can be um, a, a little bit different, but you know I think the fact that kids are working and um, they're receiving an income, they're off the streets, um, you know, out doing something and, and mm -hmm. building a resume, and so right. it, it, you know having something on a resume is important. And then at the same time, this it, it, it speaks to the city's buy-in, because that's what a lot of people have been challenging the city on. What is the city doing for you? We have limited. Um, opportunities to offer things right now because we're, we're growing as a city and we're having people to look at the public-private partnership um, like the Go Science and different things that we can offer. So when we are um, doing things like this as far as the work program, that's showing them that we've heard you and we're responding. But it's, we're also getting benefits from it as well because we still get the same calls and all those calls that we're getting or the app that they're using to send something to um, public yeah. works course can be taken care of with that's some right. of those individuals that we have so it's just something for us to think about because that's a double -edged sword on the, on the positive side but when we look at these numbers um, I didn't notice anything that talked about the number of these 25 individuals who were able to get their CRC do we have that you know I don't have that um, that's not something that you provide but that's a good point I can provide that to you later though. okay I, I mean because I, I would love for that to be a big push because that in itself we see this and this is successful right. but if this number also shows 22 mm -hmm. of the 25 right. we see this CRC we are helping to prepare them for the workplace and I know that um, Mayor Connolly just finished with some visits and that was the um, prime issue that many companies had right. but that's helping to build that workforce and then that's the city providing that pipeline so if we can get some numbers on that. I will get that to you, yes. But I do know that's, that's a big push of Peak Community College. So um, I would think that those numbers are, are pretty good, but I'll get that to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Leah, uh -huh. how many males do you have that come in this program? Um, I don't have the statistics right in front of me, mm -hmm. but just going on memory of seeing the participants last summer, mm -hmm. it's generally, um, it's probably about half and half, or maybe 60% male, 40% female, something like that. Because we do try to have, our, our goal is diversity um, okay. in terms of gender and um, race and everything. So um, we try for that, but I can give you those exact percentages too if you like that. Um, Jermaine McNair is working in NC Civil. Mm -hmm. that. I am. He's working with the youth in West Greenville. Uh, particularly the high school kids trying to keep them in school. And um, he has some very nice young men that I've met. I was late today because I met with him and then I met earnestly. But um, for the same reason, <clears throat> to help someone in the neighborhood get a job or get go to school, they have a free program where they can go to school for welding at Pitt Community College. Um, so Ernest pays for uh, the ones that can't afford to pay. So I just had to get him hooked up with Ernest, and he said, no problems. So that's somebody else off the street that can be um, 
you know, he's a nice young man, does a lot of yard stuff for us. But uh, I think that somehow or another the girls do well, but um, in our communities, but if we could, some of these high school graduates that I talked to, they don't even, they don't even have a job because they can't find a job. And you know, it's a shame that we graduate high school students with a 4.0 grade point average that you know don't have a job and then plan to stay home and maybe go to Pitt Community College or somewhere like that. But they'd like to have a job too, to see which one is more beneficial. Should I work, make me money, go to school, or should I go to school? So, yeah, um, but yeah, I can get you, get you that information that way you'll, you'll see it. I think it's also important. It's not always what you do, you know, as far as even doing picking up trash. A lot of it has to do with just getting them in the work ethic, right. showing up on time. You know, mm -hmm. I, one of the best stories I've ever heard is when I played in the Angels organization. The guy that was the scouting director at the time, he started off in the Angels organization selling peanuts. We go up and down the stadium over at, at the Angel Stadium selling peanuts. Became the scouting director. When I left, he was the general manager of the, the Angels, and he's you know, buying contracts for uh, Josh Hamilton, $30 million contracts. So uh, it's just more or less getting them in there on a day-to-day -day basis to go ahead and work. So I think that's great. I think it's good to, to see us doing that. It'd be great to expand, talk to some of the partners. You know, Maybe that's something I could talk to when I go to meet with some of the industrial businesses and see if they'd be interested in that as well. Grady White's got a sign right out front that says they're looking for employees right now they don't care what their skill set is they just want somebody to show up and be willing to work that might be a great opportunity so thank you next item um thank you mayor this next item is a discussion of nightclubs and eating establishments and um tom widenauer will be providing this presentation thank you ann good afternoon Last December, and uh, of course a few of you were newly elected and others were just catching your breath, um, I provided an overview of the club um, regulations. Near the end I had slides loaded up for dining and entertainment, we call it <coughs> d and &E, um, but we kind of stopped it at clubs. And um, I was left with a few requests for more information so that we could keep discussing clubs and d and &E. These slides kind of go between back and forth, back and forth, D and E and clubs, so hopefully that's not going to be confusing, but I was asked to provide a presentation of both. Um, this request was originally re um, submitted by um, then Mayor Candy Smith in December. Um, what we were left with after that presentation was what do other cities do to regulate clubs, how do cities we admire regulate clubs, um, distinguish between clubs, and those are public-private clubs, but just to be succinct, let's just call them clubs, and d &E's, and future discussion, which is where we are today, of whether to allow more clubs and how to allow clubs outside of downtown. So you know where this presentation's going, um, so I'll give a, a summary of clubs and d and &E regulations, chronology of ordinances to regulate clubs, the inventory of both in our city. Um, a survey of how other cities regulate clubs, both university cities and similar size um, North Carolina cities, and then discussion. The uh, zoning ordinance requirements applicable to public and private clubs and D&E uses are first. Um, clubs, to kind of shoot to the bottom of, of that first paragraph, obviously um, full service bar, um, to go back to the, the front, the principal use is entertainment, meets all the following, open to the public, may require membership, may require a cover charge, provide live or recorded music, um, may provide a floor show, dance area, and then the, the bar part, and may offer food and serve servers. D&E's, um, the difference is that they must have food sales in excess of 30% of gross receipts during any month. They must provide sit-down dining areas, and when closing at midnight, this is just an example, they must provide food at 11, so if you close later, you could serve food up till later. That's not their, their cutoff necessarily. Um, and then they may offer everything listed above in clubs and then a handful of other things that um, just optional. Um, the differences between D&E &E and restaurants as far as uh, food sales go, minimum percentage of food sales to gross receipts per month for D&Es are 30%. Um, D&Es 
D&E's to restaurants. D <clears throat> D&E's require 30%. Restaurants um, can be up to 50% of food sales minimum. Um, membership, D&E's are optional if they require membership and restaurants, uh, of course, aren't allowed to. Um, zoning districts where clubs are allowed with a special use permit. Um, clubs aren't allowed anywhere by right. They have to go to the Board of Adjustment for a special use permit and there's uh, criteria that the BIA, that the uh, board uses um, where they're allowed special use are downtown commercial, central business district area, the fringe around it, um, downtown commercial fringe, general commercial, and heavy commercial. There's club spacing requirements as you re recall from December. There's a 500 foot spacing requirement between clubs. Um, so that's what you probably have heard a lot about. If somebody has a club, you can't have another one within 500 feet. The second one is you also can't have 500. You also can't have a club within 500 feet from a single family dwelling um, located in a single family um, district. There are some single family located in like the downtown commercial area and that wouldn't be applicable. It's only when the um, zoning district allows the single family uses that 500 foot apply. Um, mm -hmm. just sure. Can you also speak to the council about the 500 foot spacing related to D&E's and cl between clubs and D&E's or are you going to get to that later in the presentation? I'll, I'll address it now. Okay. I think we get to it. There is not a spacing requirement between clubs and D&E's. Um, if I've kind of failed to mention, you know, throughout D&E pretty quickly, it's a restaurant during the day and it kind of turns into a club at night as entertainment. Um, so, thank you. let me just tell you that part. Are there, are there restrictions as far as like sales that need to take place to, to qualify as a D&E? Uh -huh. Or is that something that's... For food sales? Yeah. Yes, you have to have a minimum of 30% food sales for any given month. And if they don't meet that requirement, they're then we could revoke if, um, if they were approved with a special use permit. Then it could be revoked. You should be able to walk in any time and within a reasonable time frame. Ask for receipts. How often is that audited? Every year, um, the um, it, it's more of a uh, every year we have an annual report to the board of uh, adjustment um, for all clubs and all DNEs. I don't. I think we have receipts in that. I think it's if we suspect a problem, we'll ask for them. That we have, we have done that before. And the more vigilant we were with requesting them, they eventually knew they couldn't provide it and they shut down. Gotcha. So you said if we suspect. So basically, what we go off of if a person calls and complains, then we check it. Yes, we will definitely do that. We also know, you know, internally with other departments are told maybe planning wants to look into this, you know, police my jobs or something. And then there's a 500 foot spacing for clubs from all single family residential zoning districts. All those measurements are from the law lines, which is um, worth knowing. Zoning districts where DMEs are allowed, there's uh, four districts where they're allowed by right, meaning they can just come in tomorrow and apply for a permit and start. Um, operating and there's other districts where they have to again come to the board of adjustment for a special use permit and that's that other list there are spacing requirements for D&E's um, you have and only one pocket of the city neighborhood commercial there's only one or two it's a 200 foot spacing requirement between D&E's and neighborhood commercial zoning districts um, when DEs are within 500 feet of residential zoning districts and has outside speakers after 11, um, they must have security guards. There's also spacing if a DE has outdoor speakers. We can come back to that if that's important detail. This, uh, here it is. So, is there a space requirement between clubs and DEs? No. Um, we wanted to mention microbreweries. There is not a spacing requirement between microbreweries themselves or clubs or DEs. Um, however, microbreweries are pretty limited. They can only be allowed in the downtown commercial zoning district. Why is that? We wanted to, um, it's, a, it's actually a, um, it's something people seek out in, in downtowns. Um, 
they, they uh, there's a whole you know craft industry where people travel or if they reside they, they enjoy a good craft beer so um, to try to a uh, help boost some business of vacant properties in the downtown area and rehab historic vacant structures the Office of Economic Development City Manager's Office Attorney and Planning work together to um, make them available. We wrote the regulations and only at this time have them available in the downtown commercial district. Um, I'd have to say 2015. And now we have two or three. <clears throat> there was a history, as you could imagine, with uh, clubs. Um, there was a 500 foot spacing requirement up to 1992. At that time, the council deleted the 500 spacing requirement between clubs. Over the next several years, the number of clubs downtown grew to 25. Um, and there was a fatal drive-by shooting downtown in, in 2009. And that spurred the council to start discussing adding back the 500-foot spacing requirement for clubs, which, which they did soon after. The NAB Neighborhood Advisory Board asked the city to uh, consider a spacing clubs to residential uses and that was adopted in 2010 also. Um, in 2016 we received a private application from a, a couple of uh, gentlemen that run still life for um, a rooftop type deck and council adopted an ordinance to allow non-conforming uses to expand through construction of roof decks. It has to do with Right? That's so correct. Really yes, it was not a uh, a gift by any means. Um, no, I'm just saying, but there are a lot of there are a lot of buildings down there that are not are not they don't come up to code because the fire sprinklers and stuff like that. But they haven't they have a grant they're being grandfathered into under the other. If they were to take advantage of that 2016 ordinance and to expand their non-conforming right. use, they would have to also renovate their building to a to a modern building code entirely the entire building would have to be upgraded not just the addition and when i say non-conforming you'll see a map where um when the 2010 ordinance was passed there were already existing clubs um and they were allowed to be grandfathered and then there were then then we had some clubs come in that applied and were approved for special use permits so um Still life, as a matter of fact, um, they were grandfathered and they were um, a non-conforming use. But um, they have entirely brought everything up to code as um, the ordinance required. I got a question about this. Uh, 2009, so the number of clubs dictates that there's a drive-by? I'm saying is that is that basically what we're saying? So if we have five clubs versus 25, we won't have drive-bys. Um, I would uh, say there are two different facts, but I put them in the same line. Well, that's how the news accounts were in the paper that um, they had reached such a concentration of clubs downtown that um, they felt like re coming up with regulations to limit clubs was um, necessary and so that's um, since they were doing that to for the uptown area but we we did the 500 foot rule that's all over the city yes and so now they restricted other people from being able to have clubs in other areas because of this that's correct so you'll that is um, you'll see in some maps coming up the 500 foot rule applied throughout the city not just downtown Okay, I, I'll wait for your maps. Okay. You were on the council then, aren't you? Uh, and I fought against it and voted no. For the record. Everybody knows my record, I voted no on that because basically what they were doing was um, eliminating the possibility of other people being able to provide entertainment, not in the uptown area, but they used the uptown area as the reason why it was happening, but they did not consider everybody else. And I had many people come to me and say, you know what they're doing, right? So I voiced my concerns, and, and that's still coming up to this day. We have business owners coming back and saying, that's an ancient policy, and why are we doing it? And if we're supposed to be meaning business and taking care of people, we don't seem to be doing that. 
right now, especially with that 500 foot all over the city. So mm -hmm. that's just something for us to consider. So when you show the map, that kind of helps to get more information of how we can take a look at it. Thank you. There are 14 clubs downtown. Um, this yellow is a 500 foot boundary around the clubs. The blue and red mean if it's a pre-existing club prior to that 2010 ordinance or if they came in under special use permit afterwards, it's shown in blue. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, when, when uh, a club is located, it's a, it's a wide buffer around it where you couldn't have more. You will see another slide where D&Es have located within this big yellow circle because there is not a spacing requirement. Um, then there are also, uh, in addition to those 14, Mm -hmm. I can't see the numbers anyway. Point three, four, yeah, please. You said three and four are vacant, right? And that's, they're in by the university. They're not going to, unless the university takes a completely different direction on its, uh, on its, <laughs> on its approach to running clubs. Um, university for Ruin Company. Yeah, and that's probably, those are probably not, uh, they can probably take those off the list. Because mm -hmm. so this was Phoenix. Right? What yeah. was the other one? The attic, the, the cellar. Okay. What's, what's number eight? <laughs> you still have those up there? What's number eight? Eight is also that. vacant. That's 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 how long was that? How long was the attic? How long was the attic closed? It was like a couple years ago. Eight slides up. Yeah, uh, I mean, that bill is long. It used to be hard times most recently. Uh, it's like five years ago. Isn't there a time requirement, too, where if it's vacant for a certain amount of time, if it loses that grandfather clause? That's correct. Uh, if I can it up, dies, I think I, taken, then uh, are no longer grandfather. Six to nine months. Six months. Okay. Six months. And so probably three, four, and eight have probably lost that status by now, right? Right. Okay. I think this should be if the mayor has not visited that club in six months, then it is losing. Uh, then everybody on that list would be off the list. <laughs> so. On three and four, you're saying that's the one owned by the university? Okay. Five, five and six are, are the same bar. That's the same same account. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they connect by a door internally. I know because I went down there. Trust me. This weekend. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, cool. So we'll check. We'll check. We will check on five and six. We'll check on seven and eight and three and four. Well, three and four is good, right? Mm -hmm. That's actually three through eight. Is what three she through said. Eight. She mm -hmm. said it in a very strange way. Three through seven. Right. We can seven come seven back. Five and seven and three yeah. and okay. six and nine. Okay. Okay, beyond the downtown area, um, of those 14, put my there's, there. there's four more outside of. drinking, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. There's uh, four additional clubs outside of downtown. Club Fusion, Tiebreakers, the Buccaneer, and Buckwild Tavern. Um, here's the location of those to the south of the city. And their buffers, 500 feet. Then when we add in the dining and entertainment establishments, which are seven of those, um, and put those on the map, where the downtown areas, you'll see those appear in bright green. There are a few off to the east to the right of the slide, which are Christie's Euro Pub um, and uh, Anchors. It it's, has a, I don't know if it's still Anchors, but um, that's another one over there. And uh, Dickinson Avenue Public House, Fire, Crossbones Tavern, so on downtown. Um, and then when you zoom out to see everything on the city and their boundaries or buffers, this is this is a map that shows all 25. Okay. Um, the next map, the next couple of maps are just just checking um, how these these uh, buffers and zoning ordinances or zoning districts work together. I turned all the residential districts on yellow and then all the areas where public and private clubs and D&Es are allowed either permitted or with a special use permit red or purple for downtown. 
And then I added the, we added the black circles for the 500 foot buffers around existing clubs. Now this is really studying outside of downtown. And then zooming in, um, well, what you're gonna see, let me just go ahead and go to it. Um, this is an area around uh, Regency Boulevard and um, NC11. So when I also start projecting 500 foot buffers around the residential zones, stay away from existing clubs. I'm left with the areas that are um, identified in yellow boundaries with the crosshatch uh, yellow as available or um, eligible for clubs. So Tom, can you do me a favor? Can you go back to the, to the big city map? So just to, uh, to, for council's perspective, the areas that are in this, ye this yellow or this one case, this little green, those are the areas that we believe that a club is it could be located with a special use permit. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. The stuff inside the yellow borders. Right. There is a lot of area for right. potential. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of potential there. It, it, looks like it. Up on the it looks like it until you go in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this is very I've tried to find it myself in this. Mm. We, we can always come back with more folks in details, but this is just one side of the largest yeah, right contiguous area mm -hmm. um, to show you that. And then I think I have it turned off where you you can see through the green boundaries a little better to see buildings or if there are vacant properties within those green eligible areas. And the black circles mean? The, the, that's the 500 foot buffer around existing clubs in that particular area of the city. Okay. okay. Um, I can come back at any point, but just to keep moving. Survey of how other university-based cities regulate clubs. Generally, most other university-based cities do not have spacing requirements for clubs between one another or from residential uses. Most do have spacing requirements between clubs and places of worship, such as schools, which are typically 100 and 400 feet and are enforced by the state's ABC commission. Um, this is a list of eight cities and universities that are somewhat similar in s composition to Greenville and ECU and Pitt Community College. Um, so the list of eight at the top do not have any spacing requirements between clubs. Uh, University of Florida has a hundred foot spacing between residential districts and clubs. And then there's four below it that have some type of spacing such as Notre Dame. There's a thousand foot spacing between clubs um, outside of downtown. Old Miss, Mississippi doesn't allow clubs, private clubs in the state. Michigan State, private clubs are not allowed, only D&Es. And University of Virginia, um, private clubs, I'm sorry, West Virginia University, private clubs are not allowed downtown. We, um, from 2008, before, this, tw before the 2010 ordinance was adopted, we had a nice long inventory uh, or survey of North Carolina cities. Um, I checked a few of the top ones uh, um, under no spacing. I'll get to in the next slide, but um, there's a list of cities at the top that don't have any spacing requirements and then kind of a um, list of those that do from minimum distance to highest from Goldsboro to Elizabeth City from 150 to 500. And then, then we do have spacing requirements to other uses below that to, to residential zones churches, daycares, and that sort of thing, but still not other clubs. Um, late last week, I contacted Chapel Hill and Asheville and went online and looked at Wilmington and Boone, and they don't have spacing requirements between clubs. So uh, that gives you a little perspective of university-based cities and then just North Carolina cities. Um, so, so that brings us up to um, kind of full circle, what are we, what would you like to discuss next um, now that we brought you some clarification of terms and buffers and um, what other cities are doing? We, we, we would like some direction from council if, uh, if you'd like us to continue working on this. So question, benefits on 500 foot, why, why, why would 500 feet be ideal? I mean, do we have anything that says that? Especially when I look at the one from churches from one to 400. So 500, why that number? Uh, really, the, um, 
ordinance doesn't kind of build a case or preamble before the regulation. It just comes right out there and sets the standard. Um, so just one of the random numbers the council threw out and they just went with it. You didn't go with it. Yeah, they, not me. Um, I don't know how they arrived at that distance um, to answer your question. Okay. I mean, I was just wondering when I looked at the other college towns and, and mm -hmm. looked at the patterns of everything else, I was just trying to see if there was a, did they do this type of study? Or was it just based on their? I mean, I, I would, thinking about it for the couple of seconds, yes, I would say for downtown, they probably said, what's the widest we could go where it would shut down the ability for anybody else to have another club? 500 feet would sure do it, because that puts a yellow circle, you know, buffer all the way around. Yep. Downtown, that might have been part of it. We could certainly um, ask planning staff to go back and to check all the files from that original 2009 That's to 10. Time is money, don't waste it. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I already know the answer. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'll just I'm chime in a little bit. Exactly. You know, I, I think we're trying to um, be a city that's trying to you know keep young professionals here um, and have uh, entertainment. Uh, I think it makes sense to expand upon the entertainment that we have from you know some of the clubs that are listed up there that are really focused just on college students to some of the other areas. I mean, the Dickin Dickinson Avenue corridor right now is. Um, is a wonderful area, but uh, there's only one available. I guess there's only one club down there currently, which is Tap uh, the, a Troll Brewery, Trolling Wood, mm -hmm. right? Which is considered a club. And so, Tap uh, House is DNA. Oh, okay. And so, you know, if we're trying to expand and, and, and um, you know, I think it makes sense to explore changing that ordinance from 500. Um, uh, you know, as Candy said, you know. 500 is just a number. I, I, you know, looking back after having a drive-by shooting and a fatality downtown, that was probably uh, or potentially a knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. um, to maybe cleaning up some of the clubs that were down there at the time. Um, we've gone down from 25 down to 14 currently. Was that right? 14, the number of which three or four don't even exist. So you might be at what? 10. Um, so we've gone down from 25 to 10 in the matter of eight years. Um, so I think we need to certainly consider um, reducing the distance, going, doing away with the distance. Um, but I, I think it's also important to, um, to consider the fact that um, we have the ability um, to uh, pull certain permits if clubs are not uh, complying with um, laws or they are trouble clubs or, or issues continue to, to, to come out of specific clubs, um, we have uh, you know so, some, some power there. And ALE has some power and police has some power. Yes, sir. My biggest concern, I think, which is way more um, in terms of, you know, a lot much larger concern than the things that are being found here is, is the safety in these places. Um, there are, uh, again, I don't, I'm not, the, I'm not a club in type of guy. Those of you, I know that my appearance would suggest I am, but um, <laughs> it's you know the stories I, I hear. You know, a lot of people reporting that there are you know dramatic safety um, defects in some of these some of these places. That they have that there is um, an incentive to overcrowd and, a, and an inability to match to monitor that. A lot of these places are do not have modern fire um, safety um, yeah. systems and. You know, so if we're talking about what are we trying to fix or accomplish, I have no problem with what you're talking about, which is to create a more a modern and vibrant area down there. But to the extent we have the ability to prevent a catastrophe, um, you know, because we will have no excuse. You know, if there is, you know, if we have one of these club fires here in Greenville and one of these clubs without a uh, um, without a fire alarm, without a fire system on there, and hundreds of people die in a in a club fire, you know, it's not like we don't know about this. We've known about it for a long, long time. And so my biggest concern related to this issue is that we find some way of making sure that when citizens get together in these in a building that they have the that, that building is is safe. It's safe to the to the extent we have the right we have the power to come to require it. And I'd, I'd certainly like to hear at some point, not now, but presentations by staff as to what are the safety considerations in those facilities. 
so the realities, the safety realities in this issue. So with that being a point that's stated, that means any new club anyway has to match the current standards. Mm -hmm. Those are just the old ones that you're concerned about now. Um, but agreeing we need to um, take a look. And I think one of the things we can use is a guide that might help, because I'm also concerned about um, people in residential areas being able to you know, live and, and function without disruption. Um, looking at, and you might have to partner with the police, but noise ordinance, like when you start looking at noise ordinance and how long, because they have the, the decimal thing that they can go out and see how far noise travels and things of that nature when they get complaints. So we can use that as a, a, a measuring tool to even begin to see how far is it because there's been some places that used to have clubs and you can't hear anything next to the you know residential area but it's far under 500. But if we had that, you know, just some information on that, that might help. I do have two things too. I agree with what Rick said about some of the older clubs because I think one of the problems that you have is that, uh, you know, with that grandfather clause, I think if you make any modifications to your building, you have to meet the new code requirements, correct? Is that right? It's depending on the amount of yeah. modifications. It's based yeah. off the percentage. But I mean, if they make any substantial ones where they were to bring it up to code and have some of the safety requirements that are inside there, they could. They can lose a tremendous amount of occupancy in their building. And I don't, I don't know how you combat that. You know, and that was one of the things that got me kind of upset was with the owner of still life that came before us, made those modifications on his own, you know, and the and I think what he was assuming, maybe he was assuming that he was told this, was that you know he could go ahead and put a rooftop bar up there. And so what he did was he made all those modifications and he went from a 500 per, 500 person capacity inside of his club to now that he was up to code down to 250. So essentially he was punished by 50% for coming up to code. I don't know how you combat that, you know, because I mean, when state rules and state laws, you know, I don't know how we change that, but you know, that's that's probably one of the reasons we have those issues down in those older, older clubs down there. And maybe, maybe now that this rooftop bar idea is allowed to expand it down there, maybe that's something that they can Bring up because up, you know, my guess is the still life's probably going to take a lot of the people from some of these other clubs because it's nicer. I mean, it's just a better atmosphere, in my opinion, than some of the other ones that haven't kept up to code and uh, whatnot. But and I think that potentially what you're talking about is if you do allow more clubs down there and the new clubs have to be um, of a higher, you know, a fully safe, you know, high high quality environment. The potential exists that some of these deficient clubs are only only right. existing because they have no right. competition. Right. And um, you know, maybe maybe add maybe allowing you know more modern clubs to go down there. Maybe some of these other ones can't attract people anymore because they're unsafe and unsanitary. Uh, Chief, uh, uh, are there specific clubs that are a concern from a, a safety hazard when it comes down to fire? Well. All of them right now need that uh, qualification based upon when that club was established. So there are some that we uh, encountered some issues on. Uh, it's most of it has to do with overcrowded and the not being able to keep up with how many people are in there. So we periodically go down and check nightclubs uh, on purpose for that reason because we know that we want to make sure that they are safe. But we know that there are times we are overcrowded. Are there um, uh, Specific clubs that continuously overcrowd. I could get that uh, that information for you. Uh, it, it really varies. Yeah. Because the crowds tend to move around. So one week, one particular club may be overcrowded. The next week, it may be somewhere else. And from what I understand, is the challenge is is that we have no real good way of knowing how many people are in these buildings. Right. You know that every time you suggest that an independent person would be counting how many people go in and go out, you immediately, that's where this conversation stops with club owners, that they are willing to explore a lot of different stuff, not somebody keeping up other than them in a proprietary way up with how many people are in their building. Right. Even if the outcome is they have an incentive to, now again, sometimes the incentive is to keep people out. Again, I spent an hour walking around down there mid at midnight one night, and this is all I know, but this is what people are telling me. Um, and uh, there were like six police officers nearby too, so it's perfectly safe. Just, uh, 
the sometimes that you know they'll if they want there to be a line outside that they don't let people in, right? So you the place is virtually empty, but there's a big line outside. Sometimes they're trying to pack people in for I guess revenue purposes, and so but the resistance is always apparently going to be on you know if you you know as soon as you suggest to them that for safety purposes somebody else should determine how many people get to go in the building, and I can understand that. I'm just saying, but that's the the heart of the safety challenge. I think. They're not, it's, it's fine if there are 50 people in there, it's not fine if there are 150 people in there, and who decides? Um, I think what um, Chief Griffin will tell you is that we do know the occupancy low, the occupancy for each of the clubs downtown. The bars, so those um, club owners are required to have staff outside with a clicker that clicks to let them know how many people enter into those establishments. And if we go down and sense that there is overcrowding, city staff has the ability to say to a club owner, everybody out, we're counting everybody on the way out, so we can determine. Now that's sort of a last, um, a last resort kind of thing. We do have the ability to do that. I, the other thing I'd say from Chief Griffin's perspective is that th those clubs will meet the current, the standard on the year that they were constructed, but building, as we all know, building codes constantly change. And so a club built in 2017 is gonna have met the club, the requirement for 2017. A club built in 1985 is gonna meet the requirements of 1985 mm -hmm. as long as they've not done any significant improvements. There hasn't been significant damage to the club they can still abide by those 1985 requirements. And that is not a local requirement, a local ordinance. That is state law. That is North Carolina State Building Code. Am I correct, Chief? It's like a used car, right? But a 1995 car is not going to have the same safety equipment that a 2015 car is. Mm -hmm. But which one do you put your teenager in? So what, if the, <laughs> what I hear from the council's perspective tonight I hear a desire to understand some of the rules around safety. I also ha hear a desire for the staff to go explore the distance requirements between clubs to understand 500 is the right number, and if it's not, what would be that right number? Is it something for to give direction? Is it something that the staff could do where they can kind of analyze what 250 feet look like, maybe what 350 looks right. like, what 400 looks like, as far as like maybe drawing those circles that we saw as far as what impacts it would take or how, what impacts it would we would see in the city where at least we can kind of have a measured well, understanding. Well, in the uptown area or the, the Dickinson Avenue corridor, even 250 would still exclude any other sure. any other clubs. We, we are very fortunate to be working in 2018 where we have wonderful tech, GIS technology. So we're very easily able to, uh, to uh, now that we've mapped all the clubs to indicate if the buffer zone is 200, what does that do? If the, buff, uh, uh, if the buffer zone's 100, what does and that do? And we can do that across the entire city. Could you do for the city and then maybe do something for maybe the urban core and just see what the difference would be? We, maybe we can do that. So a dense. different requirement for city as a, for the city versus the yes. urban core. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. If you start studying this, you've got to make sure that you are communicating with, um, you know, Uptown Greenville and the Merchants Associations and the clubs, and let them know what you're studying and why you're studying it. This can't be something that pops up as a staff um, recommendation or analysis three months from now, and nobody knows where it came from, nobody knows why it was happening. Um, it's we got to be very open and transparent about this whole process if we're going to break crack back into this and start. Um, you know, start and, and even anal and analyze and consider this stuff for the purpose of revising it. This is a it's a high touch to, it's, a, it's a high interest issue. Well, if if the council provides a direction to staff, we would be happy to do some public engagement on this issue as well. Tom, <clears throat> am I understanding that Wilmington the rule essentially is 500 feet from a house of worship and single family zoning, and outside of that, there's no requirement. Yes, that's correct. I'll just reread that slide. Does everybody think about that? It sounds like they want direction, so I mean, I think that solves a lot of the issues. I think we're talking about overcrowding. The reason we have the overcrowding is because we have a deficit of, of the amount of clubs that we need for our population. 
Um, so we're having, having all these people packed in there because there's nowhere else to go. Um, I think the 500 feet from the house of worship and the single zoning, single family zoning would probably appease most neighborhoods, I would think. So would that be one specific house, right, would be considered a single family home the and thus mm -hmm. not able to do 500 feet? 500 feet is a long way. It is a, long way. And I, it is a really, really I, long way. I've had way. constituents call me from neighborhoods that have had issues with house, um, I guess, D&E or clubs, um, you know, making noise so i understand completely the need to keep it away from single family zoning sure um and so maybe if we need to look at that as even 750 feet to 500 is not enough well i was saying 500 is a really really long way okay. yeah. yeah i mean i think it needs to be worth at least if the staff could incorporate that into it too i mean i know we're asking a lot is that the house of worship and the residential zoning is that the point five, 500 from both you say 500 from 500 from either and i think that would and then the eliminate between the clubs well We'll yeah. and, and I, I also hear from Council Member Smith this concern about noise. Okay. So two things. I want to look at what would be an average amount. Let's say 150 to 200 feet would um, not allow the people in that area to be able to hear the noise. My fear is if we stay with the, the 500 feet and just say with the clubs, but have it, um, like even with the churches, the one they did, he said it was 100 to 400 there. That was under 500. And that's been something that's used and we've not even heard that come up with an issue. So I think 500 is just a large distance, especially in the city of our size. But if we're trying to look at not having overcrowding, just like they say with the options, they're very limited to what, what can be offered. So we just need to, I don't know if I'm comfortable with just saying, let's just do the 500 between those two and eliminate everything um, else altogether without them taking at least taking another look and coming back and sharing some information with us. And then according to what they share, um, after that we can do some public input and feedback. But I don't want to do all that before. I don't want to jump the gun because whenever we have public input and feedback, it's always the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So you get the squeaky wheel, that's what got us to 500 feet in the first place without um, actually taking a look at the entire process of what they were doing and um, throughout the entire city. So we're trying to eliminate that from happening. So I think it should just come to us first, just some of the things that we're looking at with the distances, with the 200 and all those things. And after we take a look at it, then we can say, okay, let's put it out for some public input because now we kind of know what direction. Because we might have to look at it and say, oh, leave it alone, I doubt. But, you know, as long as you say, I just would be very, very careful about giving staff any specific outcome here. Because this meeting is not on TV. We're not in, you know, this is not a. Recorded. It's being recorded. Know, but I mean, it's, it's okay. this is, you know, but this is not a, a full fledged council meeting. And, Again, there are a lot of people that care about this. There are a lot of people that want to um, that want that want are going to want to have input. And if if it appears that we've told staff, hey, go away and come back and see what it looks like at 200 feet. This well, I, that's I, mean, I, I think that's the analysis part of it, right? Um, you know, we're not setting anything in stone. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, that's not heard. And they're not just going to come back with just 200 feet, are you? I mean, going to give a couple of different. What? Outcomes. I'd like to see a lot of different outcomes. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. But let's not say, hey, what if we just got rid of this and kept this one thing for this place? I think that's a really dangerous yeah. starting point for this conversation. So uh, additionally, um, you know, it might be advantageous to have a overlay, uh, which would exclude maybe the downtown and, and area around the downtown, which would exclude the 500 feet or 400 feet or whatever that number is, because you know we have two churches, Jarvis Memorial, Right down, yep. wherever, right across the street. Peace of Mind Gospel Church off of Albemarle, which, you know, butts right up to, to Dickinson. St. Paul's is within several hundred feet. Yeah, so if, if we just, if we didn't have an overlay in this, this area, I think we would probably still find ourselves limiting the ability um, for development. So, um, I'm gonna, what I hear from the council is, is a desire to be, I'm going to ask staff to help me remember this, is a desire to be, to look at some more flexibility related to the nightclub rules, to explore noise, to explore locations near neighborhoods, 
and near churches. And I think y'all visually want to see scenarios of how it, right. the spacing is. Yeah, what well, would 400 feet look like? What would 200 feet look like? I mean, I think that helps solve some of the issue you're concerned about, too, as long as we're... Plus, in, in, um, plus, it would require a public hearing for us to, to change an ordinance, correct? Correct. Right. 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 To the extent you're changing the zoning ordinance. And it would have yeah. to go yeah. to plan right. zoning. Right. The, um, may I, I just... That we have, in the last three or four years, managed to, in spite of council, apparently desiring that there be you know outreach and people um, and talking to the public about things like parking outdoor dining you know i mean there's a list of um if, um, um pay you know pay parking you know, we tend to kind of sneak up on the public on things like this you know we talk about some ideas and the next thing we know the next thing the public knows there's an idea in front of us that's getting ready that seems to be where we're headed and the public doesn't feel like they've had a chance to weigh in on very much and I think we just I'm ner I'd, I'd like to make sure we don't do that again it's like we keep we trip over our own feet when we don't have to we don't we don't want to make a sudden change we want people to be involved in this let's make sure we get people involved in it instead of repeating the previous sins of the past. Transparency is extremely important too, but we want to do our due diligence and, and let the staff do their job as far as giving us what it is, and then we have to inform, make an informed decision, and, and then it's going to go through those proper channels. That's why we have the PNZ. That's why we have the public hearings. So, I mean, we fully vetted. And that's a, between the PNZ and us, that's, you know, a good 60 days just for people to review it, correct? I mean, because they go before a month before us and it comes to us the next month. May I just ask one clarifying question? The, so there's the component of what the zoning ordinance says with spacing. There's also rules related to the districts and the process with the special use permit. What I hear the council expressing is a desire to change the spacing related to noise and churches and um, other facilities. I do not hear the council expressing at this point a desire to look at zoning districts and which clubs are permissible, nor the process, including the special use permit. I'm just clarifying that. Right. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, yeah. so we're just looking at spacing. Yep. Right. Got it. So, and when you talk about districts, does that does that mean a potential overlay of a certain area? Um, I, if t it, Tom, can you go back to that slide that showed the districts? My specific question was whether or not the council was interested in it for, go There's for, club. That's for, for clubs. For clubs, it's looking at these districts. I hear, I see shaking hand. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying overlay or no overlay. We would need to talk about that. I'm just saying, for this perspective, we're going to leave the district out of the conversation. Got it. I wasn't sure, Council Member Litchfield, were you suggesting an overlay to exempt the buffer downtown or correct? To yeah, because it may make sense to have, you know, a, a zero distance, you know, from clubs uh, or, or d &E, uh, in the uptown area, in the, the Dickinson Avenue area, but it may make sense to have 250 feet outside of that area. Okay. Or w whatever the number is. Now, uh, 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 so what we will do, I, I want to just make sure, and I'm going to make sure that Valerie's getting this in the notes, so I'm going to speak really loud for the mic here. <laughs> what we are going to do is go back and and uh, a, um, a look at the distances and we're going to run some scenarios we're going to explore this idea about overlays take into account noise decibels or and churches and um, those facilities we're not going to look at dis, uh, districts we will bring that back to the council if it is the council's desire we can include in that a pu an out a public outreach campaign that we would do at the point that the council that we have received some direction from the council. So am I? Let's do I have it. a thumbs up on thumbs that? Up. I again, and I realize that you know, just so people remember that I said this. I think that if you crack this open at all for the purpose of analysis or study or any suggestion at all that we are going to make a change, then you should begin talking to interested stakeholders in the public immediately. What did they think are the problems? What did they think would be a nice change? What you know, we've had our chance to say maybe it could be this, maybe it could that, maybe. And I think that they, that the public, 
the, the and stakeholders in this area, especially in the uptown area, should have an opportunity to know we're revisiting this issue, and they should uh, and and if they, and be, they should be invited to offer their suggestions as to what types of changes might be advantageous. Because again, specific, like we tried really hard with outdoor dining to include all of the town restaurants and stuff, and we still managed to sneak up on them. You know, we looked around and, you know, we got, we, we had the wrong ordinance in the, at the wrong time being implemented in the wrong way. And we had to make, we had to back up and make a lot of changes really, really quickly because we didn't get people involved early enough. We should get people involved as early as possible. That's just my recommendation. So what would your suggestion be to get them involved early enough? If staff's going to go do this sort of analysis and stuff, they should go to Uptown Greenville and the and the bar owners and to the churches and to you know neighborhood the neighborhood advisory board and ask them say hey we're real, we're, re, we're considering revisiting some of this these spacing issues related around private clubs and D and E. Do you guys have any ideas about what could be made how we can improve this? So that means sending out an email, putting something in the paper, because we don't do that much for millions of the decisions that we make. I would imagine the 11 bar owners that are existing now probably would not, um, you know, agree with this, you know, because they have no competition right now, the 10 or 11 that are left. But I'm not opposed to putting anything out. In yeah, the do we public. post it on our website? I mean, I'm, I'm fine with what we notify uptown. I mean, I'm yeah. Just invite them to provide comment at this point rather than later when we come up with a... Uh, well, I don't think anybody's making a decision. Right? I mean, we're just doing some due diligence. And, and to be sure, you're going to write about this in the newspaper? Right? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't think it, He's just here for the food. We're good. Okay. Sounds good. Great. I Thank have, you. I have one concern for um, clubs that are grandfathered in that doesn't have the. I think all of our clubs should have proper um, um, systems for you know water and all that. They should have they should have that regardless if they are grandfathered in or if they're not because you're talking about safety issues here. You know it would be terrible if we wake up one morning and five hundred kids got burned up in a club. Yep. So I think that any safety issue should be addressed. Any safety issue in any of the clubs, whether or not they are grandfathered in or newly established, should have some type of sprinkling system or something in that club if there is a fire. Because you think about you got, I don't know how many how many people some of these clubs hold, but let's, let's say at least 250. Well, you're the youngest one. You've been down there how many years? That's right. <laughs> about 250. So... You know, you're talking about trying to get 250 kids out of a fire with no sprinkling system. You know, heaven forbid if that happened, but it will fall on us as a city as to why did they not have the proper sprinkling system or the proper safety way to get these people out of these clubs. Because what's going to happen the first thing of fire, you're going to have a mob push. And that's what's going to happen. You know, kids are going to get trampled on trying, while others are trying to get out. So it frightens me to think about that's something that we may at one day have to deal with. So we need to require them to at least have uh, the fire safety that uh, the fire department recommends. Well, and um, Mayor Pro Tem Glover, we will be happy as we come back to you to talk with you all about um, our ability. What what are the what are those requirements, and how far we can push it within the existing law within the existing North Carolina law? Legislative priority. That's, so, that's exactly that's what I was thinking. Like really? But a, a, out of the ten or eleven that are still existing, there's a handful of them that have been upfit, correct, to existing uh, code. At least one. No, there's one, there's oh, a really one it's a handful that's very been low. shot. You know, but we're talking about state law, right? So state you know, law. In, in that regard, we, to, we we would then need to get permission to tack on to these grandfathered in clubs. Is that 
Is that part yeah, of the no. procedure there, Emmanuel? I mean, I, the state building code has a fire code and sure. talks about you know, right. safety and all that. So if, if you grandfathered in, you might be an exception that they have to have a right to stay like they are. I'm and not sure. Are we within our powers then to add on, though? If they're already grandfathered in, we don't have that ability to add on. I think if you're grandfathered in, they're probably protected. That's what I'm saying. I don't know that we have the ability to go. That's why it would be a state legislative. Without a legislative <laughs> uh, push there. Initiative because yeah. that needs to happen. If, if that has to be a legislative right. for us in this upcoming. Are we going to do another one? Or are we done? Well, if we could do one more item, we have two more items scheduled. We would like to just quickly talk to you about the sidewalks. The information on the fleet study we will provide to you in writing and your notes to council. As brief as possible. Uh, quickly. Yeah. Um, so notes to council a few weeks ago. Allen Road and Fire Tower. There are three options for sidewalk. DOT is looking for. Uh, um, some guidance on this for design of sidewalk. Uh, we can do city only, city and county, or a hybrid approach. We've looked at this um, and um, foregoing some of the maps that were provided in the notes to council, the three options from a dollar and cents uh, perspective. And just a reminder that the sidewalk, we contribute 40%, DOT 60%. The three options, city limits only, 450000 If we did all the sidewalk, we're looking at 700000 And the hybrids, 570000 And the hybrid is the parts of it that are that combine together to make them a comprehensive system, even if it doesn't stretch to all the extremes. Yeah, so on Allen Road, it's the entire west side. On uh, Fire Tower, Porter Town, it's all of the north side, north and west side, and then some parts of the, in the areas that are undeveloped, um, we're not suggesting putting sidewalk there or uh, on, along fire tower. We're just doing the north side So with these roads you're talking about putting sidewalk on both sides of the road or just yeah. one side yeah. of the road? Well, how, we, we included this map in the notes to council right. so. uh, Let me jump back to the hybrid system. system. It's probably yeah. um, so here, here's an example of sort of the hybrid. We look at uh, Dickinson. Uh, the area in gray is city. The area in white is county. And if you can, the green is the sidewalk. The green is along the west side of Allen Road. And if you look at that white segment um, right here, this is undeveloped. And we're not suggesting putting sidewalk there. This gray is in the city. And then we're connecting it to the road. So we're connecting it across that, uh, that white area. Make sense going through somewhat mm -hmm. quickly? Yes, yes. So that's, that line of thinking is what we're... Um, so what's the difference between the full full boat and the hybrid? What's the cost difference? About 140000 I say we do the whole thing. What are we doing out just... So what is that I know Allen Road... Go ahead. Yeah. Excuse me. You got um, I know Allen Road and Dickerson... Um, are you talking about doing Dickerson all the way? Yeah, so that's the railroad there. Um, we are talking about um, yeah, sort of Dickinson is um, right that's down here. That's uh, Greenville Boulevard up to Stantonsburg, um, and Dickinson comes down right here. Okay, so, but there's a lot of foot traffic on Dickerson. And yes. now that you have um, these other um, businesses that have opened on Dickerson, right. so this. There's even more traffic. This topic is just about, you know, so DOT, as they're uh, doing this road project, they're going to build what's within the limits of their construction. Mm -hmm. So um, this is what's being recommended there is sidewalk on all legs of that intersection, but it's just the limits of their construction. This is just for the Allen Road widening project. Oh. Not for other, uh, what, and what we're trying to do is DOT would like a, the city to make a decision about sidewalks. Um, and so what we're suggesting is, again, to Kevin's per point, we're suggesting a complete line of sidewalks on the west side and somewhat, um, we're, we're picking some developable and some logical sections on the east side that would, would not have sidewalks. What do you need from us now? We just need to You need an action now? We need a, a thumbs up. We would bring a municipal uh, agreement with you all. I mean, and I we want to know whole, if you want to do all, only city, a hybrid, the or the whole thing. Do the whole thing. For, for $140,000 more. Can you go back to the chart? I mean, I can, I can tell you when I first got on the council, that was one of our number one priorities with pedestrian safety. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we had, I think, seven or nine people that were killed mm -hmm. 
And I, I can't imagine the fact if we went down Allen Road, and let's say somebody's going in a wheelchair down Allen Road, and then all of a sudden they get to a stopping point and they've got to stop. What's the number one thing that they're going to do? They're going to try to continue and they could get hurt, or they're going to try to go across the street to the full the full sidewalk. And the undeveloped so, parts are going to become developed. Yeah. Here, here is the, the cost, the estimated cost. So to the city and, for, for these. And we've got, what, $40,000 roughly for this budget cycle that will be left over. Well, this is all going to come out of the money we've already set yeah. aside. Well, for, and, and we're, well, we're we continuing to set that money yeah, aside. But we've got another $40,000 that could probably be allocated towards sidewalks, right? Well, um, possibly there's some additional money that you'll find out we've rolled we'll into contingency. Budget. Plus, at the end of the year, we we'll, we can see what fund, as the council's done last year, we you put a lot of the money that was um, sort of remaining in the prior fiscal year into um, reserve for these DOT projects. So we'll know more at the end. It will but never this be is cheaper the to build talk. these sidewalks yeah, gonna, than it is right now. Yeah. Okay. And what are we talking they're gonna about? 25%? Yeah, they're going to fit 60% mm -hmm. of this cost. They will, right. they will cover 60%. Of them. So what, if, then what we will do is we will bring, staff will bring a municipal agreement for both of the, for Allen, Fire Tower, and Porter Town Roads that will have the city covering the full cost of the sidewalk on those roads. All right. Cool. Awesome. Great. Sounds good. Great. That's what we need, and thank you very much. Thank you. And then we'll provide the fleet study information to you in your agenda. Work session is adjourned.